first guest is Carol Bilson, the president of the Design Management Institute. Carol is without doubt one of the most remarkable design leaders today. Carol, thank you for joining us. It's truly an honor having you on board. Thank you, Joko. I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, I can. Okay, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm pleased to be a part of this speaker series with some very prominent people that I used to read about and admire for many years. So I'm honored to join you, Joko, and of course, Karim Rashid, Bruce Mao, Stephen Heller, and Don Norman, who will follow in the rest of the series. Generally, you know, this uh, speaker series aims to address some of the new realities that we as designers are facing today. And um, I wanted to ask, uh, what does new normal mean to you? I, I believe that the longer the pandemic is with us, you know, the changes are occurring in phases. So it's almost like death and dying. You know, in the beginning, everybody's in denial. You don't really believe it. And then as the reality starts to sink in, you know, people's behaviors and attitudes change. Um, one thing I can say that I've noticed is that a lot of our members who perhaps have been silent or quiet for a while are reaching out to us. So we're getting tremendous communication from around the globe, people that want to share their ideas, people that want to tune in to listen to what others have to say as a way of learning. And of course, you know, we have some innovators who have done some small surveys of design leaders. And, you know, one of the things, the immediate things that we notice is that a lot of the medium and large companies have frozen their budgets. So, you know, travel and training, nobody's traveling anywhere, nobody's spending money. Very few people are spending money for training. So people are looking for a free, resources and, and knowledge they can learn. But that I would say that those are the immediate things that we see happening. And of course, there's a lot more going on. And in time, I believe more and more will be shared. Um, but it also prevents, presents great opportunity. Mm -hmm. How is DMI changing in well, response? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we can't do the in-person conferences which pe people valued highly you know we we always got very high marks for our in person conferences so we we now have to offer the conferences virtually um it's not the first time that we're offering virtual programming we've offered webcasts a lot in the past we've offered other types of virtual programming but um we are definitely having to relook at and make the shifts that everybody is making. And, um, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, we, we even offered some workshops on video collaboration because just getting everybody used to the technology and, you know, how to, and the lighting and the, you know, all kinds of aspects um, of virtual technologies. So, we're changing in many ways, and I expect that there will be more changes because, you know, we, uh, you know, if you listen to the experts, the pandemic is probably going to be around until next year sometime. Yeah, uh, lots of these type of things are causing an anxiety with uh, many designers, uh, especially the shift from um, in person to face to face work, essentially the remote working aspect. And um, I was wondering what kind of conversations uh, you have come across in the field, like how are professional designers adapting uh, with this new way of working? Right. Most designers, you know, yeah. Yeah, most designers generally like to have a lot of face-to-face -face experience. They like to go to workshops and build things um, and so on, make models, yes. and that is no longer the case. Yeah, no, it's, these are very, I mean, I've been having these conversations conversations as recently as last week. Um, obviously, you know, most design firms and designers have the necessary technology. So we're fortunate in that, you know, we, we have these video collaboration tools, you know, some people may be using them more than others. 
So it's forcing designers to think more innovatively about how to observe and gather information that they used to gather in person. So clearly it's creating challenges because you know, you, it, it's a lot easier to observe and conduct testing um, in person than it is through video tools. Um, so I would say that, you know, again, the shifting is happening in phases, you know, so people have, I think have gotten over the initial hump of, you know, how do I set up and engage, engage via video collaboration, but now how do I use that tool and other tools to continue to do the work that I used to do? Uh, I believe, you know, most of the, I would say independent design firms, leaders that I've talked to, you know, I've asked them about the impact to their business. And so far, the people I've talked to say that they are still continuing on. The clients still want them to do the work. You know, they may be shifting the type of work or reprioritizing. Um, I also had a chance to talk to a corporate executive uh, a couple of days ago from a major brand who is in customer experience and she was telling me that they are accelerating all their technology spending and focus around customer experience so even though she's not a designer that was encouraging to hear so i'm sure it's a mixed bag but generally speaking that's what i'm hearing from most of the, the designers mm -hmm. uh, that is interesting um in terms of Yes, all the, the challenges that we're that everybody is pretty much experiencing right now. There are also some new opportunities emerging. Um, there is always, um, historically speaking, when you're faced with one challenge, an opportunity tends to emerge elsewhere. What would you say are kind of like the new type of opportunities that are emerging for within the profession? Well, that's a good question. I I'm not sure that I have the exact answer. But my thoughts around that are whenever we're in a crisis or a time of extreme stress, it, it creates an opportunity for us to think differently, to think out of the box. It also is a time for people to try to soak up more knowledge, to do research, to read. I find that I'm reading a lot more than I used to. And so what that does is I, I find that people are focusing in a different way. So prior to the pandemic, people were extremely busy and it was very difficult sometimes to get their attention. I'm finding now that it's a lot easier to get people's attention because they don't have as many interruptions. They're still busy, but they don't have as many interruptions as they used to have. So you generally are able to get responses. So people really, um, can use this as a time to learn and to do some deep thinking and to do some experimenting and to reach out to people perhaps that they wouldn't normally reach out to. Uh, yeah, um, I kind of noticed the same thing about myself in terms of less uh, distractions and kind of more um, concentrated effort on certain things. I think that's also some, uh, I think other opportunities are um that many designers especially and I look at let's say from one aspect that our students uh and how they have been kind of managing things throughout i noticed that and we, we encourage them quite a lot for them to kind of like learn a uh, new type of skills and strengthen certain other type of skills that will be much more relevant in a remote working environment versus um, the traditional uh way we used to do things and i think the results were overwhelmingly positive and uh, quite encouraging in terms of the new skills uh, that they were uh, that the students developed. Another thing, another kind of I think opportunity has been, and this from a corporate side. Um, recently, I had a conversation with one very large um, corporation, and what they have seen as a positive was that all of a sudden they could bring on designers on board from all over the world versus before looking at just designers that were living in the area where they where, where their office was. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they were actually quite excited about it and kind of like created a whole new opportunity because 
prior to that, it was kind of like taken from granted. Well, you kind of like have to live here <laughs> and kind of to work here. But now that doesn't seem to be the issue anymore. And I think that their kind of like um, talent pool has significantly increased uh, from that. So yes. I think yeah, yeah, there are some, you know, balances here and there like that. Yeah, if I can add to that, that that's an excellent point. Um, the thing is, though, when you're meeting people for the first time, you know, if you're doing it virtually or through video, the jury is still out on that because getting to know somebody, I mean, it's better to see a face and have a conversation than to not see the face at all, but it's still not the same as in person. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens over time, but you're absolutely right. I mean, this, this perhaps will allow design services to become more globalized. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I have been following your career for the last few years and since we have a chance to know each other and um, you have been a very active advocate for diversity and equity in the profession. Um, I'm very well of, of the initiative that you mentioned, the diversity in design, and I really appreciate uh, all the work that you have done uh, in that area. So can you please tell me more about this particular initiative and some other initiatives that you have introduced at the Design Management Institute? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so, you know, as a woman, I studied industrial design and graphic design, and my career was primarily focused, the early part of my career was on industrial design. And then I stepped out of industrial design. I took a program manager role, which was about commercialization. And so I managed multiple disciplines, you know, engineering, supply chain, manufacturing, design, et cetera. And what that did was it gave me, you know, it, it, it gave me tremendous opportunity, but I also experienced tremendous hardships in my career. I, I mean, I would need a whole day to describe some of the challenges that I experienced along the way. And so, you know, I learned so much because I think you learn from positive experiences and you learn from negative experiences. And I would off whenever I would be in these difficult situations, I would think I'm learning what not to do when I become a design manager. So as a result of, you know, the life's experiences and the fact that there are so few women in leadership positions, even today, um, I always had a passion, you know, you couple this with my interest in the community. I volunteered heavily in the community as soon as I graduated from college. I'm a firm believer in giving back to the community. Part of it is my cultural heritage and my family. You know, we just believe very strongly in giving back to the community. And I was so many people sacrificed for me to be able to do what I'm doing. So the combination of that and, and the experiences and challenges I had along the way, I, I always have felt that whenever I can make positive contributions that will ins hopefully inspire or bring others along, I want to do that. So about four years ago, um, Jerry Kathlin, who's the chairman of LPK at the time, he was the CEO, and I were having a conversation and I found out that he was just as passionate about diversity as I was, and he was the board chair of DMI. So, you know, you can't push forward these kinds of initiatives without strong support. So Jerry was extremely generous, not only with his support for pursuing this, but he also offered us the facility to hold our first conference so that it could be relatively inexpensive and we could attract, you know, more a more diverse in terms of level, you know, position. So we weren't necessarily, we knew that there, there weren't that many executives, you know, women and people of color. So we had to broaden the umbrella. So to LPK as well as P&G were really our beginning sponsors. And so in, so we started this diversity in design conference um, that we, we've had now for three years. We also created a diversity and design manifesto, which is on our website. And it's really a guide, you know, for anybody, it's, it's a guide, it's an opportunity to hold a mirror up. It's an opportunity to recognize people and companies that are doing constructive and positive things around diversity. 
And then we also dedicated the third quarter issue of our DMI Review Magazine every year towards diversity. And the point about that is the topics are not all about diversity. The point is to invite women and people of color to write articles about any topic of interest to them. It could be around leadership, strategy, methods, tools, um, case studies, anything at all they want to share as a way to, to highlight what they're doing. And I'm so thrilled. This is our fourth year. We'll be coming out with the next issue shortly. And it's just amazing how these initiatives have brought, have brought people to us that we normally wouldn't even know about. So, and, and we're hearing more voices and more stories. So the whole intent here is that we want to encourage women and people of color, if they are interested in getting into design management or project management, we want to encourage them to pursue their career initiatives to know that there's a support network within DMI of people that they can receive mentorship from, bounce ideas off of, and to encourage them because it can be very lonely and very discouraging if you don't have a support network and you're trying to get ahead. That's, um, that's, uh, that's great. Um, I know from some conversation, for example, with our students uh, who are also uh, black students or uh, uh, students from other minorities and so on, one of the main uh, things that they have mentioned was the lack of mentors and people that they can identify with when, you know, um, in the profession. This also comes, of course, even within the university, within the school, but also within um, uh, the profession as well, when they either go on co-op opportunities, internships, or when they start employment. It was that kind of like a lack of role models and mentors uh, uh, was one of the things that kind of emerged quite at the, um, uh, at the top of the conversation. So it's uh, really encouraging to kind of learn that uh, you have set up such a network and actually we'll have to follow up with you on, on that on a separate I, note so that we can kind of integrate that much better with, with what we do here. Absolutely. And Joko, if I can just say one more thing. Last year at our diversity and design conference, we had over 100 people attend, 100. You know, the first year is maybe 50. And it's people of all ethnicities. You know, so while the majority were women and people of color, there were majority people there as well. There are people from all cultures. So it was really a microcosm of America and, and an opportunity for everybody to learn. So, you know, uh, people that are in the majority population can learn from women, can learn from minorities, and the minorities, vice versa can meet potential role models and mentors. So, you know, I believe what you're hearing from the students is it's, it's very helpful to see people that look like you in leadership roles. Yes, they can get tremendous learning and guidance from the teachers you have now. There's, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, most of my mentors early in my career were white men. And that's because that's all that was out there. And I have such tremendous respect and fondness for those men that helped me in the beginning of my career. But it certainly is nice to see, you know, women and people of color role models, and they are out there. And, and it took us, it took me and DMI about three to four years to find them because there aren't that many, you know, right now, most of them are pioneers. But there are some tremendously talented and very giving people out there. They're very busy, but they really appreciate the students and they want to support them in any way that they can. So I appreciate you bringing that up and absolutely would love to follow up with you later on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are trying, uh, we are trying to expand the reach uh, and and kind of bring different people. And more and more we realize that we need to kind of do these things on a levels that go even beyond race, beyond gender and so on. We need to kind of like really embrace, um, 
a culture that empowers underrepresented voices to be yes. able to, you know, uh, have a platform of some sort. Yep. Um, a culture so, of inclusion. Yes. And I've been trying in the school, you have probably kind of seen some of the things that we have been developing and so on. And my uh, executive team is very diverse and we've been trying to bring uh, new initiatives whenever we can. And we never stop. Um, we can, I can never say that we've done enough, you know. So it's like a constant work in, work in progress, everything we do. And it's um, really encouraging to see that there is an organization such as the DMI that can provide some of these additional kind of support uh, structures and support systems that we can kind of leverage and, and kind of share some of these things together. Well, you know, Joko, I, I appreciate what you're saying and I appreciate what you're doing because the mere fact that you're even raising it allows people the opportunity to dialogue and to share what would help them because for so long nobody asks what we think or or what would be helpful i mean i had a, an executive of a major company reach out to me and willingly admit you know i'm not a minority i don't understand the issues but i'm willing to admit what I don't know. And he brought a couple of his employees to have a dialogue with us at DMI about, you know, how could they do things a little differently? How could they be more inclusive? And for me, that's so powerful. I mean, this it's, it doesn't have to be rocket science. You know, you start out small and then it just builds over time. It's just like us starting our initiative. When we started it out, I, I tried to think of how many women and people of color do I know with the title design manager, design director, or VP. And I literally could write down probably five names, if even. And so literally it just took rolling up my sleeves, contacting the people I knew and saying, who do you know out there in the design world that is leading, that is doing great things, um, that we could pull into this circle. And amazingly, you know, we've been able to find people all over the world. And, you know, while the issues might be a little different in the U.S. versus in other regions of the world, the issues are still there. And, you know, you're so right about, I mean, in the U.S., you know, um, for so long, Blacks and Hispanics, you know, people of color have been left, have been shut out. And so that's part of, you know, what you're seeing coming to the surface now. But generally speaking, you know, around the world, you know, if you create an environment of inclusion where people feel like they're free to speak up and, and their opinion and their thoughts matter, it totally changes the whole conversation. So, you know, so I applaud you and, uh, you know, I wish you continued success and anything I can do, I'd be happy to, to help. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for for everything uh, you, you said. Um, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, I don't know if it's if it's OK with you, if you would like to share some of uh, your own personal career journey and tell us a little bit of, about some of the, the challenges that you had to over, overcome in your career. OK, um, I will share a little bit about my career and I have to be honest with you. You know, I'm a I'm an eternally optimistic person, an eternally positive person, and I think most designers are. So a lot of the negative experiences, I kind of buried them so they don't always come to the surface, but I'll at least share a little bit and uh, just kind of walk you through my career. So I studied um, industrial design and graphic design in college at the University of Michigan. And then I left there and graduated and I started working as an industrial designer and immediately started to experience some tremendous challenges. I mean, all the isms, you know, sexism, racism, you name it. But the thing is, a lot of it, most of it was subtle and some of it was explicit, but you know, back then, people didn't talk about these things. And so you just had to kind of suck it up and keep moving. So I started as an industrial designer. And um, 
I worked at Kodak for 13 years and I worked on all kinds of products. I mean, over a hundred types of products, everything from medical blood analyzers to pool sense, swimming pool sensors, cameras of all types, digital, traditional cameras. I mean, at that time, Kodak had 17 different business units. So I was very fortunate that I got so much design experience in one company because the, the company had a huge breadth and depth of products. But when I was an industrial designer, would you believe that I was working for seven years on so many project teams? And it wasn't until I had been working for seven years that I was in a project meeting with other women. So in other words, for seven years, I never saw any women on any of the project teams I was on. And I vividly remember the project leader was a woman engineer and the human factors engineer was a woman. And when everybody left the room, we just, we were just squealing and screaming. I mean, we were just so excited. Nobody else could appreciate that, but us. And, you know, we had, we worked on fabulous teams. I mean, there were lots of wonderful people I worked with, but it was there's just something about being able to see other people that look like you that you can feel a certain comfort level and role modeling with. So anyway, I continue to advance in various levels of design. I never, if somebody told me I couldn't do something, I would work overtime to prove them wrong. So I was very persistent. I never gave up regardless of the negativity, the obstacles that were thrown my way, the sabotage and all the kind of stuff. I, I persisted. What would be your advice to any new design graduates interested in embarking on a career in design right now. I know that many designers are worried about the current job market and they're very anxious about it. So yeah, what yeah. would be your advice well, in a career um, in design? Yeah, that's a good question. When I graduated, we were in a terrible uh, recession. So I, even though it was not a pandemic, I experienced the challenge of graduating when there were no jobs and a long recession. So the thing I would say is that, you know, first of all, don't be discouraged because, you know, this kind of thing happens from time to time. Granted, this is a pandemic. So this recession may be a little longer, but you want to make sure you use the time to the best of your ability. So if you um, are not in a network, you know, you should join a professional society, any professional society. You can join DMI, you can join IDSA, AIGA, there's all kinds of organizations. But I just encourage you, join an organization that you think best fits what, what, what your interests are, and then try to get to know some of the people. And I know everything is virtual now, but you can still look up the members and you can, you can reach out to people who either work where you would like to work or are doing things that you would like to do, or you can go on LinkedIn and look up their background. You can see where they went to school and what, what uh, kinds of jobs they had. And if they're an alumna from the same school you went to, they, Nine times out of 10, they will respond immediately if you send them a note. So, you know, you also want to take advantage of learning. So granted, you've had the formal learning, but now you can still learn. You know, you can, if you go on LinkedIn, that's the where the business community is primarily. You can read a lot of articles, you know, with DMI, you can become either a student member, which you have to pay for, or you can become what's called a non-member guest and you still get can take advantage of a lot of what we have to offer. So, you know, don't be discouraged, you know, make your voice heard, you know, reach out to people, network. We all were students at one point in time and, uh, you know, have the courage to reach out to people and try to connect with them, people that are working so they can give you ideas, help you, and eventually companies will start hiring again. We, we had a recruiter 
um, in a workshop about a month or month and a half ago. And she said that she had been, she's continually talking to, you know, business leaders. And they all said that, you know, in three to six months, they believe that they'll start hiring again. So that's, that's, that's what I can share. No, that's um, very encouraging and ending the conversation on a very positive note, I will say. <laughs> something, uh, we can have something to look forward to. Kind of, absolutely. At least, uh, kind of renewed interest in the design community, uh, in the design profession as well. So, Carol, thank you so much for your time today and thank for you. opening the new normal speaker series for us. It has thank been really a pleasure having you on board. Thank you, Joko. It's been a real honor and uh, really appreciate it. And if anybody wants to learn more about DMI, just go to dmi.org. Thank you. Thank you so much.